fans who are tuning in. You've been seeing the, the advertisements that we've had up that, are, that the piano guys were going to be with us tonight. There's been some unforeseen circumstances that they were unable to make it tonight. Um, but John Schmidt uh, of the Piano Guys, of course, you know that, um, he wanted to, to send a, a special message to everybody tuning in. And, uh, and so, John, take it away. Hi, I'm John Schmidt, and I'm so sorry that I can't be on this live stream with you, but I am here talking with Matt Whitaker. We're going to talk about my family connection to this amazing story. The background for me is that it's sort of family history for me. My mom was in Helmut Hübner's Sunday school class. Rudy Volba, one of the one of the three boys, ended up being my uncle. They wanted to find out what was going on in the world and they had the feeling that they weren't getting the straight scoop. And so 16-year-old kids got on the church typewriter, typed up what they what they were learning and disseminated this information. It's incredible. It's incredible. It makes you think of Joan of Arc. It makes you think of, you know, let's make a list of amazing teenagers. And I'm sure they knew it was something that was dangerous. I know they know that because they wouldn't even tell my mom what they were doing. They wouldn't tell anyone in their Sunday school class what they're doing. You know, 21 years ago when I first met your mother, when I was doing research for the documentary, and we did that little interview with her, I remember putting it together that that she was, I knew who John Schmidt, the pianist, was. And that she, I think she mentioned, yes, that's my son, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I had the, you know, the privilege of, of interviewing your mother and her sister, Hilda, um, 21 years ago. And you never were able to see that. Mm -hmm. um, today, <laughs> we took a minute and for you to sit down on a laptop and just watch this little time capsule. I just always assumed you'd heard all those stories before, is that? Yeah, I've grown up hearing those stories for sure. You know, it should be very sobering to all of us, you know, that the opinion basically of a child would be that feared, you know, and, and it's something that, that we, should, we, should, we should watch out for that kind of fear of somebody's opinion. That's something that, that is in my family DNA. Everyone should be able to say what they think. Helmut's hopes were consonant with their fears. Mm -hmm. You know that they, he was hoping that this would get out to everybody, and they were fearful that mm -hmm. this that the truth would get out to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so, like you say, for Helmut, um, paying the ultimate price for Carl and Rudy, years in work camps and concentration camps. And but I'd forgotten that she was so close to Rudy. He was her boyfriend. <laughs> she, he told her everything. Yeah, you Ru know? Rudy, Rudy yeah. Voba, and your mother were boyfriend girlfriend. Yeah. And I had forgotten that eventually. Rudy became your uncle. Right. How, how did, can you kind of describe to me how in the family relations did that work that Rudy was? Yeah, he, he wanted to marry my mom. She uh, lined him up with somebody else. And he told me that he liked me and that he wanted to marry me. And one time he even gave me a kiss. <laughs> and my husband, my father was not impressed by that. So, but anyhow, so we were friends all through the years until he went to the concentration camp and he took my picture with him and it gave him comfort to endure all that and he wanted to marry me but i sent him to my husband's sister and he got stuck there and i am with her brother <laughs> so we are brothers-in-laws now you didn't roll it there did you <laughs> Rudy married into the family of the girl that told him she didn't want to marry him. I guess is the way it works. <laughs> and hearing what my mom had to say about fear, about freedom, you know, was was really, really impactful. He had to pay for it with his life, and the other two boys had to pay with it with their freedom and had to suffer in concentration camps. Freedom really means, freedom is the most precious thing anybody can possess. And to me, I like freedom. And that's why I came to this country. The way she said that was just... Was she proud to be an American? Absolutely. Yeah. 
I never got to meet Rudy. He passed away before I became aware of the story, mm -hmm. but I became very close with Carl, mm -hmm. and he was the same way. You know, a proud German, of course, mm -hmm. but loved America Absolutely. with all of his heart. Yeah. yeah. When I interviewed her at the very end, almost as a, as a coda, <laughs> she kind of threw in this story about the piano. Do you mind, I'm assuming you grew up hearing that story, but do you mind mm -hmm. kind of sharing that story of the piano and the bomb raid that your mother shares on that? Yeah, it's just, it's just amazing, uh, you know, the way they, they told that story. In 19... 43, July 1943, there was an air raid, a major air raid on Hamburg. All of a sudden, my father comes and says, our house is on fire, we all have to get out. So everybody came and helped our furniture, whatever we could save. The first thing they wanted to save was the piano. And our house was burning and the piano stood on the street. As they watched the house burn down, the neighbors watched them playing the piano on the street. Our neighbors haven't forgotten after 20 years, after 30 years, that we played Joy to Life. Joy to Life because the lamp is still burning. That must have been a sight for the neighbors to behold. The way I always heard the story was that they, they just felt that God was with them. In the street as their house was burn, burning down, like this feeling of everything's going to be okay. From my perspective, this teenage girl, your mother, with her family surrounding this piano while the house is burning, bombing raid, singing this song, this praise to God. And when she told me that story, and as I look at it now, I just think, it is in your DNA. Here's this piano that's pulled out of this house. <laughs> and these years later, her son is one of the piano guys, <laughs> you know? Well, it's and, and amazing pian how I, I, I look at what my mom talked about and how those values and the things that their experiences kind of get get passed on. John, thank you so much. I'm so excited to have you and all the piano guys teamed up with us on Truth and Conviction. Um, it just seems like uh, it's just a perfect I'm, thing. I'm elated that the story is being told by the people that did The Chosen. Are you kidding me? That is, that is really, really, really amazing. <laughs> yeah, be able to partner up with Angel Studios and, yeah. and, and get this out to the world, the story out to the world. That's exciting. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't that cool? So again, um, great thanks to John and Stephen and all the piano guys um, for their uh, sincere interest in teaming up with us on, on this project. Again, they were so sorry that they weren't able to make it tonight, but I was so grateful that John took the time to, to sit down with me beforehand and, and record that, that sweet experience. I'll tell you, as a, as a filmmaker and somebody who loves history, and, and particularly World War II history, um, you know, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, when I was was doing all of this research, discovering all of these things about about Helmut Hubner and and his two friends at church, and you know, all of these other um, other friends that they had, I was just I was just kind of obsessed, I guess, with trying to find out anybody who knew Helmut or who knew somebody who knew Helmut. Um, and of course, you know, my friendship with Carl was, um, was incredible and, and life-changing. But as I mentioned there in my conversation with John, I, I never got to meet Rudy. Um, and he had passed away in 1993. And so I, you know, his part of the story, I'd read his book, he wrote a book and I'd read his book. Um, and I think, I'm trying to remember, but I think even in his book that he talks about uh, carrying this photo um, when they were prisoners of, you know, when they were in prison camps and um, after their conviction, carrying this photo of this girl that um, really gave him strength throughout that time. And then to sit down with that girl, John Schmidt's mom, <laughs> And, and be able to hear the story from her mouth and get her perspective. Um, and also that just that amazing, um, that, that amazing experience that she shared of during those, the bombing raids in 1943 when their house is on fire. And what's the first thing that they wanted to save? The piano. 
And I can just see that little family with that teenage daughter um, out in front of their house, which was burning down, and playing that, that song and that praise to God and seeing the neighbors surrounding them watching this happen. And then that teenage girl doesn't marry Rudy, <laughs> marries, uh, marries another person that they, that they knew in their little church congregation there, but Rudy married into the family, so Rudy becomes the, uh, you know, part of the family and then eventually becomes this, this lady's son, John Schmidt's uncle. So, you know, all of those things. So I have to say it was, and there's a photo of Rudy right there, and he just, he's about 15 years old there. That photo was taken just shortly before, in fact, may have been taken when they were in the middle of their resistance efforts. Um, and he was arrested just, you know, shortly thereafter um, and spent the next three, three and a half years uh, as a prisoner. Um, but, but to hear, sometimes we can look at experiences like that, I think, or at least I can, um, and just think it's so far, far removed. You know, that was so long ago, and, and we may struggle to feel a connection with those things. But then I sit down with John Schmidt's mom, <laughs> and she knew Helmut, and she was there when all that was happening. And then you sit down with John, her son, who carries that legacy of a love, not only a love of all things piano <laughs> and, and a love of music, but a love of freedom and a love of liberty, um, those things that were obviously passed down to him from his parents. And, uh, and suddenly it's not that long ago. It's not that far back. So uh, again, special thanks. We, we are um, already uh, figuring it out with the piano guys. They've made it just so clear that that we're going to get this rescheduled probably within the next couple weeks. And so we will have both of them on a live stream with us uh, within, within the next two or three weeks. And, and we will let you know as soon as that's scheduled, get that back up on, uh, uh, you know, get that advertised so that you'll know when you can, when you can tune in for that. So again, thank you for, thank you for that. Thank you for your understanding. Um, a couple quick things I wanted to, uh, um, to touch on before we dive into kind of the meat of this of this live stream, which I'm super excited about. Uh, but last week, um, during the live stream, we announced uh, the Lifeliner Initiative. If you if you were tuned in last week, you'll remember that uh, we announced the Lifeliner Initiative for Truth and Conviction. And I'll just briefly explain because now it's happening. What what this is is we are inviting anyone who would like to to submit. Um, or to nominate um, somebody that they know or somebody that they know of who in their eyes and in their mind is a lifeliner. And what we mean by that is someone who reaches out to save or help someone else. And that can be in, in very dramatic ways. Um, I, I think of um, my, my friend Richard from the fourth grade who... When we showed up at school one Monday morning, Richard wasn't there. And then we found out why. It's because Richard had a younger sister who had fallen into a canal, and he had jumped in to save her. Well, Richard didn't know how to swim. But he was able to get to his sister and push her out of the canal, um, but he wasn't able to make it out, and he, he drowned. And I've never forgotten that. You know, of course, I've asked myself, would I have had the courage to do that? Would I, in the moment, have been that brave and just and just done that? Well, of course, his sister is grateful for the rest of her life. So, in my mind, Richard, my friend Richard, is a lifeliner. Okay, now that's a very powerful example, but we've been we've started receiving other examples from people who who are are submitting the names of of maybe just a friend who could see that they were having a bad day or a bad month and who reached out to them and genuinely asked, hey, what can I do to help you, and meant it. Um, that's a lifeliner too. And so we're inviting everybody um, to, to submit the names. And you can see there, so what you do is um, just, this is real, <laughs> really low tech, okay? You just pick up your phone and make a, make a little, what we're calling a lifeliner video. It could be a one minute, three minute thing just to, to tell us who this person is, you can say their name or not, as uh, however you want to do that, and then just why to you 
they are an example of a lifeliner. Um, and, uh, and then post it on your social media. And then what you need to do is, is tag us. So it means, so tag truth and conviction, truth ampersand, that little symbol, truth and conviction, and then hashtag lifeliner, one word, okay? So tag us at truth and conviction, hashtag lifeliner, submit that, submit that or post that to your socials, to Facebook and Instagram, and we will, um, we'll, we'll see it. And then we're going to create this really cool, for lack of a better word, a mosaic of your submissions, of, of voices who are, and, and faces who are telling us about someone in their life or someone that they know who is a lifeliner. And then as we're able to, coming up in November, we're actually going to have a really cool little um, event where we're going to show some of those and, um, and get to uh, send some gifts to, to some of you who submit those. So again, just a, a plug for our Lifeliner initiative. I think it's really cool. It is, for me, what Helmut was um, during his life. For him, he found the truth. As a, You see that kid in the middle there. That's Helmut, you know, 16 years old right there. They were probably putting out flyers. I don't know if it was that night after that photo was taken, but um, but they were they were involved in it, you know, during that time. And he found out the truth, and he picked up the in honor of the piano guys. He picked up the only instrument that he knew how to play, and that was a typewriter, and um, and typed the truth, and then extended that lifeline to others by risking his life, and in in the end giving his life to spread the truth and share the truth with, uh, with those around him who were, um, in a sense, in darkness. And so um, spreading some light to, uh, to a world that had been uh, inundated with propaganda. Um, so I just think that's a, such a powerful concept, and I love the idea that these lifeliners, they're all around us. Okay, this isn't, uh, it's, it's not the exception to know of or to know someone who, who is a lifeliner. They're all around us doing things to help other people every day, all the time. And that's why we want to create this beautiful mosaic and let truth and conviction be a place where people can go and remember uh, lifeliners. People are doing good all around us. Okay, so thank you for, for hearing me out again on that. I hope that you'll take just a minute and think of someone and then post that to your socials. Again, uh, just tag uh, truth and conviction, truth ampersand conviction, and then hashtag lifeliner, and we will, we will see it. Um, okay, uh, just a quick reminder um, that if you go to angel.com slash truth, uh, you can uh, find out a lot more about this, about uh, the Truth and Conviction series, about this true story of these teenagers who stood up to Hitler and, um, and that's also the place where if you feel so inclined, you can express interest in it. Right now, uh, we are in, we're kind of gauging interest and, uh, and, and seeing, you know, who of you are, would really like to see this be made into a movie uh, or into a series. And, and we'll talk more about that. I still say movie every once in a while because for a long time in this journey of getting this story told, it was just a movie, but now it's going to be so much more than that. And that will be the focus of what we talk about in just a few minutes. But again, if you go to angel.com slash truth and, um, and express interest and let us know um, if these kinds of powerful stories are important to you and, and let yourself be a part of, um, of helping us get there and get it made. Okay. Um, hearkening back for a moment to, to, uh, that, that uh, conversation I was able to have with, with John Schmidt and then seeing, you got to see just little portions of that interview that I did with his mother. And again, it's just a reminder to me that these were real people, you know? Um, I love that little um, detail that she, she gave. Of course, she said, you know, he wanted to marry me, but then she kind of smiled and said, he, uh, he even kissed me one time and my father wasn't too pleased about that. So, <laughs> you know, it's just this little remember that, that the Helmut's friend Rudy was a teenager and uh, he was interested in girls <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously was a handsome kid himself. And so that these were real people. And so from, from a filmmaker's perspective, especially 
one who is, uh, yes, obsessed with true stories and particularly World War II stories, um, it's that uh, opportunity and that challenge to take um, actual people, historical figures, in some cases, historical heroes, um, and translate them into film characters. Um, that process of, of gleaning and learning as much as, as I can about, about someone and about a story and about the people involved with it. But then, you know, you can't just take that and say, okay, this is all going to be the movie. You have to, there's a, there's a craft. Of course, you, 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 I'm sure that you know this. There's a, um, a craft um, involved in, in sculpting a true story and creating a, a script, you know, a screenplay out of that. And then from there, that process of translating that screenplay into something that happens in front of a camera and, and eventually in front of an audience. And uh, to me, it is absolutely magic. Um, I know how to do that. And yet at the same time, it is still filled with beautiful magic and mystery to me. How how an idea or a story that I hear about eventually becomes something that people either go to a theater or, or sit in their, in their homes and on, on TV or on their phones now, um, watch a, a movie or a series based on this idea or this story that I heard and are moved by it. And, and sometimes it changes their lives, you know? Uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of movies. Um, there's a shot, you look at that shot there from a, a film that I wrote called Instrument of War and these incredible actors, German and British actors in there that we shot with in Lithuania. Um, you know, it, it, telling these kinds of stories is just so powerful and so magic to me, but there's also just a lot of the nuts and bolts and, and getting down to what are the steps that it takes to take something from a true story to a script to the screen. Um, and so I wanted to just dive a little bit into that tonight with um, the story of truth and conviction. And so, of course, if you've watched any of my other live streams, you know, I got to have visual aids, I got to have some props. And so I've brought some of those. Um, let me show you this. This is, um, let me hold that up so you can see it, and then I'll set it down. But this is a very, very old copy, and you can see how thick it is. So this is about a 123-page uh, copy. Oh, there, cool. See, this is almost like a cooking show. I'm, uh, they've, they've put a really cool camera up there, so you can you can see it. But um, this is back when, uh, I'll hold this up. This was called Truth and Treason. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah, cool. Look, they can zoom in on that. So this is back when uh, it was called Truth and, and Treason. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, I wrote, you know, with my, my writing partner, e partner, Ethan Vincent, and, uh, and together, you know, this was, I don't know what draft this was. This was in, this, this, is, this copy is from, uh, you know, 2009. So this is probably draft, I don't know, 50 <laughs> or something like that. Um, but it's fun to, I'm glad actually that we kept the, this old copy. Um, and as you, you know, if you kind of page, page through it, you can see that, you know, we, we wrote a draft and probably thought when we, when we hit, you know, fade to black on page 123, we probably thought it was just perfect and beautiful. But then you, see, then you, you take a few days and you come back to it and you realize, oh man, this needs work. And so, yeah, if you can go to that overhead camera shot again, you can see uh, just, it's just filled with, you know, our, our notes and scribbles and, and question marks and, and all those things because we knew that, okay, so some of this is working, some of it isn't, you know, here's a, here's a line that he says, but you know what, we could just, we could cover that with a look instead of a line, you know, those kinds of things. And it's this really fun process, fun for me, uh, of, of going through and, and finessing and honing and refining the script. Um, sometimes a, a script, a, a screenplay for a film is referred to as, as the, the blueprint of the movie. Um, and in a lot of ways that, in some ways that's accurate. It is, it really is, you know, like a blueprint for a, for an edifice, for a home, um, just gives all of those, it's, it's what the, the people who are going to build the home base all of their decisions off of. And so it's so important 
with a script being the blueprint of this movie, it's so important that it conveys the um, everything that it needs to, so that uh, uh, so that the film will look like what it, what it needs to um, at the at the end of the day. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, there you go. That's even a better shot. You can kind of see just quickly some of those, <laughs> some of those things that uh, we thought were perfect when we wrote them and then realized, oh, no, we can, we can make this better. So um, for many years, and I'm going to say for you know, about, uh, I don't know, 19 years, um, this was the direction we were going. This is, this, this is a script for a two-hour movie. Um, you may or may not know this, but in a properly formatted screenplay, uh, the a, a script page, so I'll hold one up here, script page like that, will uh, on average last about one minute. Okay, so it's about a minute per page. And so if I've got a 123 page script here, that's, uh, you know, about, about a two hour movie, a little bit over a, a two hour movie. As I've mentioned before, when we started meeting with Angel Studios, uh, their reaction was, man, we love this story. This is so powerful. We really want to do this with you guys, um, but we think it should be a, a limited series and not just a one-off movie. And as you've heard me say, if, again, if you've tuned in before, you've heard me say that, that at first my reaction was, no, I think you know, we've, got a, we've got a great script here, um, two-hour movie, this is what this is. And then um, I had a really cool experience where just a few minutes later I just kind of saw four episodes. So instead of one two-hour movie, I saw four episodes. I saw how they started and ended and, and all that. And so and, and, and the, at the second end of the second episode, I saw this incredibly powerful cliffhanger. Um, the third episode, I saw it was going to happen. And then this climax, powerful climax in the fourth uh, episode. And all that kind of came to me as we were meeting with the guys from Angel Studio. And I I'm sure I was still listening to what they were saying, but I was really just thinking, whoa, they are right. They're right. This is much more powerful as a four-episode limited series. And what that did, so there's this, which became, I went home and started writing these. <laughs> I don't know if you can see those. Um, four, 45 to a minute um, long episodes. Um, so if you see, you see this one, it says episode 101, uh, Truth and Conviction, episode 101, When the Night Cometh. So that's the, uh, that's the, the title. And once you see the episode, um, you'll understand uh, a little bit more what that, uh, that title, When the Night Cometh, refers to. But I just wanted to take just a few minutes tonight and kind of dive into just episode one. Um, and kind of give some peeks into how we are approaching um, these characters. You know, we have this 16-year-old this kid, Helmut Hubener, who, like I said, even, of course, I didn't get to meet him in person, but he was a, he was a real person. You know, there's, there's evidence he had a, a crush on this girl at the office, which happened to be City Hall. He was working for the government, <laughs> you know, and she was working there, there with him. And, and going from a two-hour movie to a, a limited series allowed us to delve into into that subplot and and uh, and delve into his his interest in this in this girl at work. Um, so I just want to take maybe just a couple minutes and kind of describe for you the way we're approaching some of these characters and how we're how we're introducing them and kind of what takes us through the arc of episode one. Of, of truth and conviction. Um, I'll, I'll avoid spoilers and I'll make sure not to give too much away, uh, but there are some, some really cool things I think that, that people may be interested to, to find out. Um, that when, I go to, when you go to page one, one of the fun things about doing um, episodic uh, television and, and streaming series now is some of these series are coming up with some really, really cool cold open. And I don't know if you can see that even at the top of the, right there, uh, we call it a cold open. And it's usually some, some gripping scene that immediately grabs your attention and brings up some questions for you. Like, wait a minute, who is this? What's happening? This is, it makes you want to definitely watch what's going to happen next. Um, and so 
I'm not, I promise I won't read a whole bunch here, but if I can just, I'll just read this very, very brief cold open, okay? Um, and it says, interior, the chamber, night. The first thing we see is his face, calm, reflective, head shaved, eyes downcast. In total silence, a searchlight washes over him, and he looks up with his piercing blue eyes right at us. And another stab of light burns across him. From behind, we see the back of his shaved head, meager neck, bare and bony shoulders, framed between two narrow arched windows. A final blinding searchlight shuttles past the narrow windows just before we jolt to black. And then right after that, we go to this incredible chase scene where we see that same, that same kid that we just saw, that face with the shaved head in some sort of a, a, a chamber. It's not clear where, where he is, but then we cut to and we see that same kid running for his life down an alleyway being chased by a member of the Gestapo. Um, and, those, and then those are quickly over. And then we go into uh, the opening credit sequence. And then after that, we see that same kid. Of course, that kid was Helmut um, at, at two different points that we'll see in more depth later on in the series. Both of those actually not, ev not even in the first episode. We're already uh, planting seeds and giving hints of things that, are, that we're going to see and experience in, in later episodes uh, of the series. But uh, right after that, our first actual opening scene is of the four friends, Helmut with his best friends, Karl Heinz Schnibbe, Rudi Voba, and one who's not in here, but another good friend, uh, Salomon Schwartz, who was his, there's, there's a photo of Salomon, who was, uh, who was Jewish, and um, was also one of their friends, and and Zalamon was um, his his arrest by the Gestapo and his disappearance when he was taken and ended up in a in a concentration camp was for Helmut um, kind of the final catalyst to start his his resistance efforts. He was learning the truth from the BBC radio that he. The, the, the shortwave radio that his brother had, had gotten hearing the BBC broadcasts. Um, he was learning other parts of the truth from some banned books and banned literature from the archive at his work where he worked. But it was, it was that third thing. It was his good friend, his Jewish friend, Zalamon, and his disappearance that um, was really the final straw. And so, but in this first scene in the script, it's before all that. And it's these four boys standing at the top of a, of a little cliff over, over a, a lake or a river, trying to dare each other to have the courage to jump into the water. <laughs> and Helmut is afraid of heights. And so he's, uh, even though it was his idea to get him up there, now he's ch kind of chickening out. And you get to, we get to get these insights. So we meet Carl, who's full of bravado and kind of, you know, just a jokester. And he's, of course, the first one to jump off, you know, have the courage to jump off. And then everybody else follows suit. But even though we're in Nazi Germany, we're quickly immersed in the, the friendship and the characters of these, of these four teenage boys who are dead set on, on finding adventure and fun, even in Nazi Germany. Of course, the very next scene, um, they're confronted with a Hitler, Hitler youth leader who's asking them, why weren't they at Hitler youth? And Carl, why don't you have your uniform on? And, uh, Quickly, we get a, a glimpse into the other side of, of things. Another character that I want to talk to you about and how we, how we introduce him, you know, that's a really important thing in any, in any script is the first scene where you meet a new character and how they're introduced, um, what, uh, you know, what, what is immediately grabbing or engaging about them. Um, you may have heard me mention in past live streams that for me, learning Helmut's story was life-changing and, and so powerful. But as I dug deeper into the details of the story, and Carl had told me about the Gestapo agent who was obsessed for about a year trying to hunt down whoever was putting out these treasonous flyers. And, and Carl only knew him by his last name. He knew him as, as uh, Agent Musner. And... And that's kind of, at that time, that's all we knew about him. But over the years of lots of digging, we were able to unearth and find and discover much more about this man who 
during the day and during the night he was chasing people <laughs> um, and during, you know, torturing people, frankly, for information. But then he would go home and he was a loving husband and father. He, and we know that now. We, we, we know that he, who he was married to. We, we know the family that he had. We have very direct evidence of what kind of person he was. As I became more and more aware of, of this character, um, I, I just became so fascinated and it became very important to, to me and to Ethan Vincent, my co-writer, that, that these really, these two characters, this young 16-year-old resistance fighter and this hardened Gestapo agent who, like I said, <laughs> could do really bad things, but also somehow was loving and kind to his family. Their two stories kind of interweave back and forth, especially throughout the, the first episode. We're, we're just meeting them, and, and as the Gestapo agent finds those first flyers and, you know, those kinds of things, and, and uh, seeing those stories weave together, until, of course, eventually, not in the first episode, but eventually um, those two stories collide and it would change both of them forever, uh, change the rest of their lives. Uh, so how we introduce the, um, the Gestapo agent um, was very important to Ethan and me as we were kind of crafting this. Now, there's a lot, of course, that we don't know about him, uh, but uh, so we have to kind of fill in and flesh out the, the put flesh on the bones, if you will, um, but in the very first scene, of course, there's that, that cold open where we see him chasing Helmut, um, you know, down that alleyway. But, uh, but then after that cold open, we kind of flash back to early 1941, and we just see this man standing outside of his office. We don't know who he is or, or where we are. And, um, and then a car pulls up, and his wife is driving, <laughs> and she hands him his, his little Instamatic camera. He's a camera bug. He, he loves taking photos. Um, and so, and, sh and she says, you know, you left it in your other coat. And he says, thanks. And he has this little conversation with her, and, and with, uh, she's holding their little three-year-old daughter, and their 10-year-old son is there, and they're going to the movies. They're going to the matinee. And, and even his little son asks him, hey, Dad, can you come with us? Come to the matinee. And, and he says, I, you know, I can't. I've, I'm in the middle of a meeting right now. And so... They say their goodbyes and drive off, and then he turns, and we follow him into the building where he's going to go back to the meeting that he's in, and he's interrogating someone, and that's the meeting that he was referring to, to his family. Um, you see that hallway there, that's the actual, that's an actual um, Gestapo um, prison, prison hallway and prison cells that we'll, we'll actually be filming there in, in Lithuania. Um, very, very uh, chilling and powerful place to, to work. But so that's, that's the way we introduce the, um, our, uh, our character, our, our, our Gestapo agent. Um, and I just think it's, it's so powerful. So by the, end of, by the end of episode one, you really know who this 16-year-old boy is and you, you're rooting for him and you're, and you're, you're feeling for him. Um, you're also getting to know this Gestapo agent who at first you think, oh, well, who is this guy? And then you think, oh, he's doing horrible things. And then you see him being a kind and loving father. Um, these were real things. These were real people. Um, we got a comment here. It says, um, oh, because the Nazis were brainwashed that they were doing good work from, from Lynn Rochelle. Lynn, thank you for that. And that is, that is such a good point to make, is that they were inundated with propaganda. You know, all most of them could get was whatever Hitler wanted them to hear. Uh, and it was, you know, someone like Helmut Hubner who got access to this banned shortwave radio, an illegal shortwave radio, got access to the truth um, that that's what opened his eyes, you know. So, uh, thank you, Lynn, for that for that comment. Um, I just wanted. So anyway, I I, I kind of get. Uh, uh, you can see that I get caught up, and <laughs> kind of excited um, about this. But there is a moment in episode one. I mentioned earlier that Helmut's uh, dear friend, Zalomon Schwartz, his Jewish friend, was um, was eventually arrested and taken. And we don't know the details of, of what happened that night. 
that he was that he was taken by the Gestapo and and so we've had to kind of you know flesh out we know that uh, shortly before that happened Helmut had gone to visit him um, and other other friends had gone to visit him but we don't know the details of of you know what happened in there and so that is something that we had to kind of create there he is again that 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 young man uh, was taken by the Gestapo um, and eventually ended up in a in a in a, a concentration camp. Um, so we, as as I'm writing this with my writing partner, we're trying to figure out well, let's what this what could this have been like, and um, and so we ended up writing this this short little scene. I'll actually pull it up from the old script, um, and and I'll tell you why in just a second. But uh, I'm I'm gonna just. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like they're saying that the, that the, uh, the kitchen camera for the, the overhead is, is not working, but I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just, here, let me just show you. <laughs> That's the scene that I'm talking about takes up about that much space right there. The, uh, the scene of, of the arrest of, of Solomon Schwartz. Um, and, uh, I, I just want to dive in because what we did a number of years ago, quite a few years ago now, um, we shot some concept scenes, some concept footage from from this old script, and um, so it's 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 really cool to for me now to to look at this, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of go through and just very quickly read um, this little scene, and then. Um, we're going to look at the storyboards because we did up before you shoot just about any scene. Uh, very often, you'll, if you may be familiar with the term storyboards, which is just kind of like comic book cells that, but it basically breaks down how a scene will look before you shoot it. And so we have very talented artists who come in and 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 sketch these out. I have zero talent in that way, but we have these talented artists who come in and sketch out these storyboards and and help to visualize. Um, the scene, the way that the director wants it to look, and it's an it's, it's kind of an effective way to convey to others. We may read it in the script and see things differently, but once you get storyboards, you get a much clearer idea of oh, I see that's it. you're seeing it from that angle, and then we see then we're going to move to this shot and then cut to this. Um, so I'm just going to um, quickly read this very brief scene of Solomon's arrest, and then we're going to look at those storyboards and see how. Uh, at each step of the process, things get a little bit more refined and, and, you know, not necessarily exactly like it's written in the script. So this is what it says. It says, interior, Zalamon's bedroom, night. Zalamon parts the curtains and peers out his window. On the street below him, four SA officers pile out of a truck. The curtains close. A needle drops on an old 78. A record player emits the crackling melody of strings, Mendelssohn. Fingers tremble as they trace across the spines of books. Solomon pulls a thick one from the shelf, then reaches behind it and retrieves a deep red one, Thomas Mann, an appeal to reason. We drag it, he drags a chair from the desk to the middle of the room, sits, stands quickly, slips on a jacket, sits again. Footsteps thump down the hallway. Solomon deliberately opens the red book. Bam, bam, bam. Solomon closes his eyes. So that brief little scene um, is our imagination of what that must have been like for him to, uh, to do that. And, and that book that's referenced, this red book, was a book written by a band author named Thomas Mann. Um, he was a band German author, and the book was called An Appeal to Reason. So even in his last moments, we see him doing something, uh, an act of resistance, by sitting down with that book. Now, let's we, we did up some storyboards before we shot this concept scene. Ryan, can you bring up uh, the the story? Okay, so this is where, so by the time we were getting ready to shoot this, um, those first lines about peeking out of the curtains and everything, I, I thought, no, you know what? I just wanna start this scene by seeing a close-up of, of uh, the phonograph and the needle dropping onto that record. Yeah, there you go. And you can hear that sounds from outside, wheels screech to a stop, men yelling. And then what's the next shot that it cuts to? Then we see his hand and you see that arrow pointing that, that tells you that his fingers are kind of just softly tracing across the, these books. And then that's where he pulls out the big book and reaches behind it and grabs the little red one. 
and I have a close-up of that. Um, and then that top left one, that's where at the time we had, we were going to go up past that shot, there you go, of, of having him wearing the Star of David on his sleeve and going up across that. And let's go to the next one to a close-up on his face as he turns, as he hears the, the, the Gestapo coming down the hallway, getting closer and closer. And then he takes the chair, moves it to the center of the room, um, sits down, and opens the book. And, uh, and then he looks up at the door as they start pounding on the door, it says foot that footstep, yeah, footsteps thumped down, and then pounding bam, bam, bam on the door. We see him looking, and then we cut back to him, and it, he closes his eyes just as we hear the door bursting open. So um, that is uh, the, the storyboard that we, that we put together for that scene. And now um, you, you may have, if you've tuned into to other live streams or been to angel.com slash truth, um, you can, uh, uh, you've see, probably seen this scene because I love to show it. Um, but we're going to stop and start a little bit. I, I kind of wanted, I've asked Ryan to, to, let us kind of start watching this and I may kind of talk us through just some of the elements of, of this scene because what often happens is that you'll, you'll have a great script scene, a great scene scripted out and you'll have these storyboards all planned out and then you get on set and then, you know, the actor may say, oh, what if, what if I did this? What if I did this instead? Um, and, and you, th you know, as a director, I have to be open to that. I have to be open to those good ideas that are going to come from someone else and, uh, and say, ooh, yeah, let's, let's do that. So as we watch through what we actually shot, I'm probably going to stop and start things a little bit. Um, and, uh, and Ryan, if you don't mind, just kind of, we may have to press stop and rewind and, and see. So let's, if we can, let's just uh, start this out and, uh, and see what we see. Okay, there it is. I don't know if you got to see it. says Mendelssohn in the center of that. And then we just see that close-up of him putting that down. And, of course, the importance of Mendelssohn is that that was a banned Jewish author who uh, was one of Helmut's favorites. And, and we believe that Zalomon may have introduced Mendelssohn to Helmut. Uh, and there he hears that. Now let's stop there. Can you stop that there for a second? If you remember, in the script and in the storyboard, we had the, the Star of David was going to be, you know, he's going to be wearing it around his sleeve there. Um, but somebody on set, it may have been, and you may recognize that actor. Yeah, there, thank you. Yeah, that's the way it was storyboarded. But then if we go back out to the scene, you'll see that he's not wearing that. Um, somebody on set had a great idea that I thought was that we needed to do differently. And so we're going to see the Star of David, but it's going to come in a moment. Okay. Go ahead and, he grabs the red book and then go ahead and play that. And then as scripted and ends in the storyboards. And, but now we have him putting on his jacket before he, uh, before he sits down. And that's where you see the Star of David. Because they also were sometimes sewn, sewn onto the... Thank you for stopping it there, Ryan. Uh, and, you, and you can see it says Jude, which is German for, for Jew. Um, and sometimes they were required to have them sewn. They could wear them on their sleeve. They could wear them, you know, sewn onto, onto the front like that. And so there was a decision made, let's put it there, and you'll see in just a moment why, why that decision was made. Go ahead and play it, Ryan. Okay, stop it there. Um, somebody had the idea of... Let's, let's let him, the last act of defiance, let's let him tear off that Star of David that, that the Nazis are forcing him to wear and, um, and tear it off and, and drop it on the ground. Now, I get chills. I've seen this so many times, and I get chills every time I see that, but um, there's a moment that, that happens in just, in just a few seconds here that I actually didn't see on the day. There's a little detail that I didn't notice until we were in the editing room. And then I saw it, and again, I got chills. So, Ryan, go ahead and, and, and play it from there. Okay, stop there. You see him drop that Star of David, and then puts his foot on top of it, and steps on it. Um, 
I, I need to ask our actor there, my good friend Ethan Vincent, my co-writer, who I said, hey, will you come play this part for us in this little concept scene we're doing? Um, I need to ask him if he remembers if he did that on purpose or if that's just something that happened in the moment. But for me, just one of those really powerful little detail moments that wasn't in the script, that wasn't in the storyboards, that I didn't even notice when uh, we were filming it. But there it was on film, we saw it in the editing room and just thought, okay, that's just one of those blessed little details, blessed little moments. So, okay, go ahead and, and play that forward as he hears them getting closer and closer to his door. Okay. Thank you, Ryan, for that. Um, just to hold it right there just for a second, that look right there um, uh, just, I, I think, conveys just this beautiful mixture of terror and defiance. Scared to death, but not going to let them win. Just... Uh, so powerful for me. Um, Ryan, can we, uh, let's, I just think, if, let's just go now, go, now that we've kind of crawled through it and seen some of those details and everything like that, if we can just uh, take a moment and, and watch the whole thing through from, from, the, from the very beginning to, to the end and just kind of see what that idea that we came up with of what this must have been like from the script page to the storyboards to shooting it on camera, to the the final scene of this of this concept scene. You want to go ahead and play that. Yeah, like I said, I've, I've seen that scene hundreds of times now, and it gets me every single time. Um, I think that's just a little sliver of a, of a glimpse of a reason why I do this, and specifically in this case, why I'm trying to tell this story. Um, there was a, a teenage boy named Zalamun who was taken away from, from, of course, from his friends, but from his family, um, and who never came back. And there was a young man named Helmut who was his friend, who who said uh, enough is enough, and and we're going. I'm going to do something, do something about it. So, um, you know what, everybody, thank you so much for kind of indulging me, <laughs> and letting me just kind of take us through, just to give you a glimpse of 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 a, just a a concept scene. Uh, of course, when we when we go and shoot episode one and shoot the other episodes of, of Truth and Conviction, uh, we'll be reshooting that scene, um, hopefully better. I'm, I, I'm sure that it will be, but we've set the bar kind of high there. <laughs> uh, I just feel the power of that every time, every time that I watch it. But um, so I'll put these uh, wonderful scripts away. Um, I'm just so... <clears throat> So excited to, to be able to shoot four episodes and dive deep on these. So I hope that, oh, there was a comment. 
Let's see, it says lump in the throat for me listening to it from Tina Urane. Tina, thank you. What a, I get the same thing. Like I say, I've <clears throat> I've seen it many times, and I get I get a lump in my throat uh, just about every time that I watch it. Um, so again, just a little flavor, just a little taste of the power of the story and and what's to come. Um, I would encourage you if you feel so inclined to go to angel.com slash truth. You know, it's it's interesting that I I'm a lousy salesman, <laughs> um, but I'm a passionate storyteller. And so when I say go to angel.com slash truth, um, I just want to share more about this story. And and if you get a chance to go over there and just express interest, if this is the kind of story you want to you want to help us tell, then um, I'd be so, of course, grateful, um, grateful to do that. Okay, uh, man, that was that was fun, and I got a little worked up. Um, let's see, I've got. Oh, hey, thank you, Garrett. Uh, Garrett brought me on our wonderful little quarter size sheet, and let's see, we got a message uh, from Kip Meekum. Hi, Kip. Uh, such amazing storytelling. Thank you, Kip. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I agree. This is a, it's a powerful story and um, it needs to be told, um, in my humble opinion. But uh, Garrett just brought me, uh, we had some people, th- oh man, people who have been expressing interest. Uh, we have Eric S. from Pennsylvania who expressed interest at $1,000. Um, we have um, Mitchell L. Uh, at $1,000. We have Janice A., I believe, um, at $150. Um, we have Anonymous. Um, he's jumping up all over the place. Anonymous from New York at $23. Thank you so much for all of those. Um, and I know that there were uh, many others of you who have been expressing interest at angel.com slash truth. And, and I'm very grateful. That's how this, how this works. You know, how this working with Angel Studios, how these movies and series get made. Uh, it's power to the people. And uh, I think that would make Helmut proud. <laughs> I, I think he would love this kind of model um, for for telling powerful stories that that don't always get the attention that they should from kind of from from Hollywood. And and I'm not Hollywood bashing. Uh, please don't take it that way. My some of my very favorite movies have come out of Hollywood, um, but sometimes it's hard to find. Some of the best stories, and that's what I think. Truth and tr- truth and conviction is example uh, is an example of that. One of those uh, just powerful true stories that, uh, with the partnership of, of Angel Studios and with your um, interest and and involvement, that we we can tell and uh, and tell it to the world. So again, thanks to you and to everybody who's who's been able to express interest. I'm um, going to change gears real quick. Just a couple more things I wanted to, to talk about. Um, I had, we just got these today. If I, I don't see if I can hold this up so you can see it. Um, this is uh, a shirt. And uh, if you can see, oh, let's see if I can hold this up more clearly. Oh, I'm doing a horrible job at this. <laughs> it's kind of backwards. Okay, so if you see that says remember. And, and b- behind that, are the numbers 27, 10, 42. So Helmut, oh, there. Can we do that one more time? There we go. Uh, There we go. 27, October 27th, 1942. Um, And that word, remember. That is the day that Helmut Hubner was executed um, outside of Plutzensee prison, outside of the city of Berlin, as a 17-year-old, and um, and that day is it is an important date. And here we are, 80 years later, um, remembering. Uh, next week will be the 80th anniversary. We have a comment that says, "I so appreciate your passion, heart, and conviction to testify of these young, courageous young men." Corinne Higa, Corinne, thank you. I, that that makes me feel um, good. I do, uh, I do feel <laughs> passionate about about this story. Um, we also. So I, I talked about the date, and there's just kind of an example in red. We've got red T-shirts and, um, and these gray kind of long-sleeved, long-sleeved shirts. Let me just try and hold it up so you can, I don't know if you can see that. But man, I just love that. I, I love what that is, the subtleness and on the sleeve where it, it says uh, truth and conviction over there. But um, 
I'm not I'm not selling things. <laughs> At this point, these are not for sale. Uh, the reason that we made these is because next week we're going to Germany uh, because the German government is going to be remembering Helmut. And so on Thursday, October 27th, um, in the chamber where he was executed, um, there's a, an image of it there. Thank you, Ryan, for bringing that up. Um, it's now a national memorial. If you remember, hold that up there for a second, Ryan. Do you mind going back to that to that image before of the chamber? Um, and you can see it there. You see those two arched windows? Now, if you'll remember that opening cold open that I read and that young man with the shaved head uh, standing in front of two arched windows, um, that was a description of the actual execution chamber where he gave his life. And in that same chamber... Next week, on the 27th, the German government will be honoring him. And we, the Truth and Conviction team, I with my partners, Russ Kendall and John Foss, uh, also with members of the Angel uh, Studios team, will be going over there to participate, to take part in that memorial service, and also to be up in Hamburg to um, kind of go in the footsteps of Helmut, the places where he, where he lived, where he went to school, even some of the cells that he was held in after his his arrest. And so we're going to be there all next week. Um, we had these these shirts made so that um, we can wear them in honor and give them out to people in honor of of uh, 10 20 or 27 October, 27 10 42 and to remember. Uh, remember Helmut, remember Carl and Rudy, remember what they did and remember all those who stood up for truth. And so I would, I would invite everybody um, next week on the 27th, we will be doing a, a live stream from Germany, from just outside of, um, of this, this memorial, this execution chamber. And uh, yeah, that, that you can see a good shot of it there. We'll be outside there um, and on the 27th. And I would invite all of you to, to mark that down in your calendars. And of course, we'll be, we'll be there all week, and so we'll be sending posts, uh, social posts, and, and doing a li another live stream, I think, uh, a couple days before that. Um, so uh, just uh, want to make everybody aware of that and, um, and give... Uh, I just want to... I just love the way these turned out, man. So I just think it's so dang cool. Uh, and we got a comment here. Oh, I would buy one of those. <laughs> Let's see, who is that? Janelle, uh, Janelle Lurance. I would say Lurance in French. Um, Janelle Lurance, thank you. That was, well, uh, like I said, uh, Janelle, as of right now, they're, they're, not, for, they're not for sale. <laughs> but they may be in the future. And, uh, and I, again, I, I just love them, and I think they're great. And, and we'll be wearing, you'll see us wearing them uh, next week um, in memory of Helmut. And, uh, and I hope that you can, you can tune in to that. Okay, let's see. It seems like there were a couple other just quick uh, announcements that I needed to make. Uh, Ryan, were there any questions? I, I, I forgot to even say up front that I'm happy to answer questions. Were there any questions? One or two questions that I can answer I've got time for? Great. Um, you want to put those up, and I'll, I'll take off my readers so that I can read. Um, it says, when do you start receiving funds to move it forward from Fonda Hart. Fonda, thank you. I, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I can't be specific, but I can say this, man, we're close. <laughs> you know, we're in, this, we're in the um, expressing interest phase, gauging interest, and so um, the, it has to reach kind of a certain point and a whole bunch of things have to be lined up before, um, before we know that, okay, we're ready now for all those people who, who did express interest, um, now, you know, we'll then have that opportunity to, um, to invest. And, um, and so, of course, again, we're not, we're, we're as, soon as, as soon as we reach those, get everything lined up and are able to do that, um, we'll make a big announcement so that everybody, everybody knows about it. And, and then, you know, at that point, the cool thing, that's where it gets really cool because that's when, that's when it becomes real. Um, that's when people can say, you know what, um, I've, I've talked a lot about that we need good movies. I, I've talked a lot about that, that um, you know, why can't they make a movie about this? Um, this gives us all an opportunity to, in a sense, put our money where our mouth is. Uh, so Fonda, again, thank you for that question. We will be sure and let everybody know 
um, as soon as that uh, opportunity um, opens up and um, and we can start that you know that process of of getting the you know getting the financing in place um, it says uh, will there will there be any actual torture scenes in the series uh, from happy odd girl thank you that's a that's a really good question um, Short answer, uh, yes, there will be, and and I and I don't take that lightly. Um, this was, you know, this was Nazi Germany, and um, I mentioned this last week. But I have read the the notes, the minutes uh, that were taken by the Gestapo as they were interrogating Helmut Hubner and his friends after they arrested them, and they would use these terms like. Um, um, after assiduous persuasion, we convince the young man to share such and such. Well, that term, assiduous persuasion, what do you think that means? Yeah, it means they, they tortured him and, and they beat him. Um, and so we're going to be very careful and, and very cautious, but also real in the way that we portray those scenes. Um, I, it's important to me that... Um, that this not that it's important to me that these that this be something that that a, a parent would feel comfortable with their teenagers being able to watch but at the same time i don't want to make light or or you know lighten something that was not light but that was very heavy and so it's kind of a long answer to a really good question but there will be some of that in this in this film and and um, and we're we're i feel very strongly about the importance of shooting that and conveying that um, accurately but appropriately. Okay. All right. Um, any other any other questions, Ryan? Okay. Okay. Good. We'll we will stop there. Um, thank you, man. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, and one one more time for you, uh, piano guys fans that that uh, that are still with us, and and all of all of you, truth and truth and conviction fans. Um, Angel Studios fans, um, thank you for for tuning in. Um, we are we are in the process of, of figuring out when we're going to reschedule the piano guys, so that um, and, and of course we'll let everybody know that as soon as we do. It's going to be we've already we already had it planned out, <laughs> and uh, and they were super excited about it. There's some really cool things that they're going to be doing when they're on with us live. Um, I can't say much more than that, but. Um, but just know that we'll let everybody know when that's going to happen. Again, tune in next week when we are in Germany, um, in Helmut's footsteps. And, um, and I hope that you'll, you'll tune in for that. Go to angel.com slash truth and, and express interest. And we will see you from Germany. See you next week. You've just seen the proof of concept trailer for Truth and Conviction, which will be the first dramatic series about teenage resistance fighters in Nazi Germany. It tells the true story of Helmut Hübner, who at 16 years old was willing to sacrifice his life to stand up for truth and freedom. There will be more powerful scenes to follow, but I just wanted to take a moment and invite you to join us. If you think this story should be a series, show your support. Click or visit angel.com slash truth and let us know. How did you first discover this story of Helmut Hübner? I heard about uh, an old man who was the last surviving member of a teenage Nazi resistance group 
named Carl Heinschneve, heard that he lived less than an hour away from me. I just called him up on the phone, asked if he would be willing to share his story with me. He said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I went up to his house, and sat down with him, and let him just share what his experience was uh, as a 17-year-old with his best friend, Helmut Hubner, and another friend, Rudy, 15, 16, 17 years old, standing up against Hitler. And they weren't using guns or fists to do it. They were using a typewriter. I was scared. I was actually scared because we read in the newspaper every day how severely these people get punished. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth, you know. The truth was deadly in, in Germany. But I was nosy enough to want to know more. The story that Carl told me that day um, has changed the rest of my life. I walked out of his house that day just knowing we have to make this into a movie. We have to tell this story. We've had the opportunity to become really close friends with Carl uh, over the years. He would share these experiences that he had. He would often get this distant look in his eyes. You could tell he was back in those moments. But to hear this you know, 80 year old man saying, this is what we did. You know, that brings a reality to it, that it's just not just a story, but people lived this. What came out of that was you know, this not only we have to tell this story, but I feel entrusted to tell the story from Carl. The screenplay is, is incredibly powerful. Matt Whitaker and his writing partner, Ethan Vincent, have really captured this engaging character piece set within Nazi Germany. And it's, it's gained the attention of, of Hollywood uh, producers, including Jerry Mullen, who was the Academy Award winner for Schindler's List. He understands the power and the importance of telling stories from that era. It's really amazing to me to think this kid was 16. He wasn't 25, he wasn't 42, he was 16 years old. I had enough to, to realize that he wasn't gonna get, he wasn't gonna give in to something that he saw was wrong. One of the most important parts of the story for me was Helmut's friendship with Zalamon Schwartz, who was Jewish. One day, Zalamon disappeared and the Gestapo arrested him and Helmut never saw his friend again. We went to church, to our church house, and there was a sign on the door which read, Juden is the Zutritt verboten. Jews not allowed to enter. And we had one Jewish member in our branch, Solomon Schwartz. You know, and they didn't let that young man in. He stood outside the door, and when we opened up with it, opening him, he was crying, but they didn't let him in. I wonder how I would feel if somebody took my best friend away. You know, what would I do for Helmut? Um, it was time to sit down and start typing up the truth. It wasn't too long after Helmut started typing up these leaflets and putting them out that he realized he needed help. And so he went right to his two good friends, Carl Schnibbe and Rudy Voba, and asked them to help him. Helmut said, let's make a promise. He who gets caught first takes the blame. Don't incriminate anybody. And that sounds good to me because I thought I'm cool. I was the oldest, you know. I said, they don't catch me. So I said, all right. So uh, we went that night home with uh, about uh, 15 uh, flyers. And Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer. Hitler is the guilty one. And I put him in telephone booths. I put him in, in mailboxes. The following Sunday in church, he saw me coming and he waved at me and I waved back and he yelled to the church, they haven't arrested you yet, have they? And oh, I said, will you shut up? I was, <laughs> you know, so that was him with joking, you know. They were dispersing these treasonous leaflets uh, throughout Hamburg, Germany. They put them in phone booths and mailboxes and sneak them into coat pockets at the opera, eluding the Gestapo for almost a year. <laughs> Eventually, they were caught, they went to trial. At a certain point, Helmut decided he had to stand up and he had to take the attention and focus all on himself to save his two friends. And so that's exactly what he did. He stood up, he did what was right, and he let the consequences follow. Helmut was executed for standing up for truth. Carl and Rudy spent years in prison and in hard labor. An experience I'll never forget was going with Carl back to Germany and visiting 
some of those places where he was held as a prisoner, as a 17-year-old. But also visiting the site where Helmut was executed. And being there with Carl um, was, was truly moving. There was a busload of teenagers that pulled up with their high school teacher. And they got out and they were looking, you know, visiting this site. And he just immediately gathered all of his students around Carl and said, tell us your story. To watch Carl tell them what he had done when he was their age was so powerful. They were getting it. That for me was when a seed was really planted. I began to realize that this isn't just a powerful story. This is a story that changes people who hear it. Just another quick invite. If you want to see this story made into a series, click or visit angel.com slash truth to show your support. Don't worry, you're not buying or committing to anything. We just need to gauge how many of you want to be a part of bringing this story to the world. And action! We are partnering with Baltic Films in Vilnius, Lithuania to shoot Truth and Conviction. Uh, we produced two films with them previously, and uh, we're excited to go back and, and work with a really great production partner. They previously produced HBO's Chernobyl series, as well as HBO's John Adams miniseries and the BBC's War and Peace. Another partnership we're very excited about is with Angel Studios. They've had such incredible success with the Chosen series, and we're excited to bring this project to the global audience that they've been able to reach. Our mission is to tell stories that amplify light. And when we saw the story of truth and conviction, and what that, the creators behind that story, we realized that they were gonna be able to tell a story that has those same principles that The Chosen and any other project that amplifies light. And it's a story that needs to be told today. It's a story that matters now. Helmut had big blue eyes. I mean, really big, dark blue eyes. And I never saw Helmut emotionally, you know. He never showed his emotion when, when something happened. And when I put my arms around him, I told Helmut, I see you pretty soon. His eyes filled with tears, and he said to me, I hope you have a better life and a better Germany. And then he cried. You know, we talk about stories like Helmut's story of someone sacrificing their life for someone else. I've always felt that there's like this, across humanity, it's like there's this deep connection with those kinds of stories. For me, that's what Helmut did. At some point he must have known he was gonna be sacrificing his life to do that, right. but he did it anyway. That compels me to tell this story. I personally, I'm asking you to get this made, get it out there, let the world understand what this young German kid did in 1942. Talk to your friends and tell them. Even though he died in 1942, his example of courage, of character, of commitment, we're talking about today. I love what he's about. I want to be just like him. Thanks for watching. Help us share this powerful story to honor Helmut, Carl, and Rudy, and hopefully inspire a new generation. To express your interest in this series, click now or go to angel.com truth to show your support. <laughs>